Hi, everybody. Welcome to episode 146 of the Effort Report. I'm Elizabeth Matsui, and I'm here with Roger Pang. And that's your cue to say hello. I, I you know, after how after 146 episodes, I, I still can't figure this out. You can't figure this out. Well, maybe I need to change it up. Like, am I just supposed to dive in beyond that? I feel like it's rude if I don't introduce you. Uh, well, I think the problem is it, we've gotten like a little bit less organized because, like, in the past, you would be like, in this episode, we're going to talk about this, this, and that. Oh, but we don't have a title anymore. And I foisted that. I've been passive aggressive and not filled in the title ahead of time. I don't think it's been aggressive. I think you've just been passive. I've been passive. Okay. Forcing you to come up with the titles. And that's fine. But the problem is that like, I have to like, we have to do the episode before I can come up with the title. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> so uh, that's why I'm like, I'm waiting for you to give me the, you know, the abstract of the episode. Right. Well, I don't know. We have to see how it unfolds. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. Well, should we let it unfold? Sure. So we have um, an email from a listener and the listener asked about basically like a double degree, meaning an MD and some other degree. And so they write, I'm an engineering student and I really want to become a physician engineer by getting an MD, MS in engineering. And so they have sort of questions about that they want to do research and interact with patients what do we think about the physician engineer path emerging? Is it a pipe dream um, to imagine seeing patients and also working alongside engineers and developing new medical technology? And I thought this was a really a, a good question for like a larger discussion about the MD plus other degree okay. kind of model or pathway. And well, obviously I'm biased because I have an MD and an MHS. I think it's an awesome way to, to go if um, you have a desire to extend whatever clinical work you would do beyond the clinical setting. Um, and that could be in terms of engineering or bench lab research or health policy or um, you know, health administration or health economics or, or what have you. And so, I uh, fully endorse this and I wouldn't let the fact that maybe the most common combination of dual degrees maybe doesn't include an MD with an engineering degree now. I wouldn't let that stop me from you know, pursuing that because to me, that seems like a potentially wide open field and, and partly because the MD brings sort of an understanding of, say, the practicalities and the clinical needs for any kind of engineering solutions. And having that engineering degree allows you to either pursue that kind of work independently, or I would say for me, what my MHS has done is I'm in a much stronger position to collaborate with people who are real, you know, research methods experts. And it's enriched my work and made my work that much more impactful. Um, and so that at the least getting a master's degree puts you in that position. And at the most, it may put you in the position to kind of lead work at the intersection of medicine and, you know, whatever your other degree is in. I guess the downsides are time and money. So it takes more time and then it costs money. Many of these dual degree programs, though, are um, either subsidized or built into MD curriculum that already exists. Um, at the medical school here at UT Austin at Del Med, third year medical students can go and get, you know, like an MBA or a master's of public policy or other master's degree. I don't think there's an engineering option as of yet. Um, and it's rolled into all of their, you know, normal um, kind of tuition that they would be paying. And then oftentimes, if you're getting a degree, like I got, which was as a part of my pediatric allergy immunology fellowship training, there were sort of um, ways that the medical school helped subsidize the cost of tuition for me at the School of Public Health. Um, so there are ways to deal with the money part and the time part. And I remember kind of older guard people saying this to me at the time and me not necessarily feeling this way. So this is an example of advice I was given that I didn't believe, which is that <laughs> the uh, t 
time, it, it, the additional year or two is like really not that big of a deal, I would say. For the additional year for getting this other degree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I would say I, the the money part may be substantial, right? Like you certainly shouldn't be taking out loans, or you know, you should be avoiding that. And I understand that 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 could be a major detraction, but money aside, if that part's covered from the perspective of a 50 something year old, that what's another year or two. And the, the rewards are actually, um, I think really great rewards and there's no question that it's worth any additional time. Can I ask you a question though? Cause this is like, this is pretty far outside my you know, ex- area of expertise. Well, you work, but you work with MDs with double degrees. Yes, and I'm and, and the thing that struck me is that I've not I don't think I've yet encountered anyone who had an engineering degree. Yeah, I ha- I don't think that I have, unless perhaps they like <laughs> didn't tell you. <laughs> well, it, it, well, obviously they didn't tell me. Like maybe there are people who who didn't deli- like. There's a difference between deliberately picking that path versus. Well, I went and got a master's in engineering. And then I decided I wanted to go to medical school. And then sometimes what happens is, is they end up pursuing a path where they lean into that engineering background and experience as well. Yeah. Like, I think I can imagine people like this. Um, like, I can't really name anyone because just I can't think about it at the top of my head. But like, so I, and my point being that, like, I think this is ne- not necessarily a typical pathway. Um, which is, and there's nothing wrong with that, but I think someone who does this would have to be okay, like kind of blazing the trail a little bit because it's not like people, you're going to walk into, like, suppose you get employed at a medical school or something like that. You're not going to walk in there. People are going to know, like, here's what you do when you're an engineer physician, right? Like there isn't going to be a template for you. There may be more of a template for someone who has like a, a degree in epidemiology or a clinical investigation or something like that. Right. So I think that's issue number one. So if you're ready for that fine right uh the other thing i guess i would say is that um i just i don't know i guess my feeling with like engineers in medicine is that often they're not seeing patients (laughs) i mean like they're like for example there are a lot of medical device companies that employ mds right there's no like this and and they are but they are doing that like they're not seeing patients Um, And I just wonder about like the feasibility of kind of really committing to both, I guess. I'm going to push back on both counts. Okay, go for it. So to me, that model is no different than, you know, there's not, there is a school of public health part of the UT system, but not at UT Austin. It's not that different than me having joint appointments like in Epi and Environmental Health Sciences when I was at Hopkins. Like people understood that model. And so the engineering model is you'd have a joint appointment in an engineering school and it's not like you would be doing epi or environmental health sciences, but maybe you're developing some, you know, monitoring device for some physiologic measure and you're um, helping to, you know, pilot test it or something. And that all computes in my mind that that would make sense. And just because this content area is engineering, I don't think that it makes the model that much different. No, okay, I, I'll go with you there. I agree. I mean, I think practically speaking in an academic setting, it could work, like no different from like being jointly appointed in some other place. Right. Yeah, I agree with that, totally. Okay. One thing that I, that I do think is tricky though, is in terms of the, which maybe less so now, but in terms of the funding, right? Mm-hmm. Like engineering funding... And I think it's more like the NIH is doing more than the NSF. Like engineering funding tends to come from engineering funding types of sources, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And they often don't fund health research. Right. uh, Because the NIH is there to fund health research. There may be a challenge. I just think this is not like an issue for the person. You know, it's an issue for like the system, right? Uh, Because it's like there's, there's like this bright line between health and like everything else, right? In terms of the funding. Mm-hmm. And if you're in like a medical school and you need to fund like some huge percentage of your salary, right? Uh, and you want to do it building devices or building, you know, or building stuff, right? Then there are kind of like, I think, institutes that are interested in this kind of technology development, I think. Mm-hmm. But it's not like the same as the amount of funding for like build, doing a cohort study, you know? 
Right, right. No, and I, I, I think that's a that's a good point. And it, so that your funding sources may need to be different. And then the other thing is that if you're being promoted through a medical school versus through an engineering school, that that might be different and be tr- trickier to navigate. Yeah, like this was my point in terms of like there's no there may not be a template at the place where you're going to be. Like I'm having trouble thinking about it, <laughs> right? Like it doesn't mean it's not possible, but like someone's going to have to think this through and uh and it's not always necessarily great to be the first person like to be the test case, you know what I mean? Right. Right. So, uh anyway, but I think it's interesting. So, I'm happy for someone else to do it. But not you. Well, you know, I'm past my prime. It's, you know, it's <laughs> too late for me. Maybe maybe you could get a dual, you could be the only dual biostatistician engineer. Uh, well, <laughs> I doubt I'd be the first. Uh, but um, we actually did, uh, ages ago, I remember we interviewed a candidate who was like an MD biostatistician. Wow. Yeah, like had full on, it was like an oncologist and a like biostatistician and which did they do first they mostly did biostatistics they're like, they're like in, you know doing bioinformatics that kind of stuff uh-huh. but i mean is this someone who went to medical school and then so it was like oh, I'll oh get a P. like yes i think like, it wasn't like an md phd program it was like a md and then a phd program okay okay and we did have and that said we did have one i'm aware of one md phd student in our who's like actually did their phd in biostat Wow. So it's happening. Yeah, it's happening. <laughs> I don't know why. Like, I guess that story is relevant. I don't know. It's a dual degree story. There you go. Right, right, right. I'll also mention that there's a big upside to the dual degree, which is that when you have a foot in in two different disciplines and have some expertise in those different disciplines, I, I think it puts you... You could do more. I mentioned kind of that you could do more impactful work, but I also didn't explicitly sort of say in some ways, if you have the right funding source to go to, it puts you in a much stronger position to get funding, given that it's aligned with whatever that you know, that organization wants to fund. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think my uh, under it could be that my, I don't have a, like a strong understanding of like NSF funding, like that maybe the attitudes have changed over there. But like my understanding is that if you were going to, if there was any whiff of like health research in, in an NSF grant, like they would not fund it. You were host. Yeah. Yes. So uh, if you were like, I'm building a medical device, then it's like, go to the NIH to get that funded. Right, right, right. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, but you know, I, my, my uh, understanding of that might be out of date. Second follow up and other small things. I don't, have we talked about off prints before? I don't think so. Cause I don't even know what they, what you're talking about. Well, I've forgotten what they were called. So I was talking with um, someone on our research team who's a fair bit younger than I am. um, And they just got their first first author paper published. And so you have to go online and sign these copyright forms. And as a part of that process, they ask you if you want to purchase off prints. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. (laughs) And so I was talking to this person about this and they were like, what? What are you talking about? And I was, and I tried to describe what they were. I was like, well, like you get this stack and it's like, they've sort of taken, ripped your paper out of the actual print edition of the journal, you know? Um, so it's like on its own and actually to pull up a picture of off prints in order for the, this person to like understand what exactly they were, they were floored. And then they were floored that it was like, they were like a couple dollars a piece and like the smallest order you could order was like a hundred of them or something. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and then there's this question about like, well, what do you do with them? Indeed. And I remember that my mentor from fellowship had them for like, a, you know, some paper he published. And I asked for one, I think, cause I was like, oh, I need to read that paper. And he's like, oh, do you want me to autograph it? <laughs> and he was sort of making fun of the whole autograph thing, but it th- turns out it was a thing. People would like autograph, you know, like a book or something. They're off prints. You know, to, they're off prints and hit and hand them out. That I was not aware of. I think I might, there might still be some off prints of like my first journal article somewhere. 
So you had ordered off prints at some point for some article. Very early on, yes. I, I think um, I think they might have been given. To, well, back then, like you had the page charges, right? Yes. So, like I think as part of the page charges, you got a free, quote unquote, free, like, I don't know, 50 or 100 off prints. Okay. Yeah. And did you go around your department handing them out? I think I might have mailed one to my parents. <laughs> did, 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 did you autograph it? I did not because I didn't know that was a thing. I, now I regret. That yeah. was a thing. Come on. <laughs> So part of the reason I'm bringing this up is that it's like a reminder. There's this whole generation out there who like has no idea what these things are. And they're better off for it, frankly. They are. And who's buying them? That's the other question. The off prints? Yeah. Oh, and I would get an email asking if I would mail people an off print. Did this ever happen to you? Like just from random people? Dear Dr. Pang, we saw your paper, blah, blah, blah. And I'm emailing and, you know, I'm writing to request an off print. Here's my mailing address. Uh, I think I've gotten one or two of those. Yeah. For articles for which I did not have off prints. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, this is like, you know, talking about the old days of academia, we could turn that into a segment. We could. <laughs> I mean, we could, we could turn that into a whole podcast. <laughs> wow. Yeah, for the young people out there, you know. So I don't have anything else to add. I just... It's funny. Well, I think one thing that's funny is that this copyright, you know, those like boilerplate forms that you have to sign when you publish a paper, like I don't think they've changed since like 2003. You know, like, I, I, you know, it feel, the whole, well, I'd say the whole business feels like it hasn't, you know, really changed at all. Like we're still paying page charges. Like for what? <laughs> right. Well, and I guess there's been a, there's... Right. There's been this attempt to have open access journals. Right. Yeah. There's been, right, the UC system started to refuse to pay the Elsevier fees, right? Yeah. Yeah. So maybe. Changes afoot. Maybe. But yeah, this is, we're, we're talking the off print era was like 2003, as you said. So when I came back to my office, like after, you know, 18 months or whatever. Uh, like the number of copies of of paper copies of journals that I had like in my mailbox was like, it was a little bit upsetting. (laughs) Oh, there's a stack on my little, you know, conference table or whatever in my office. And I was talking to uh, my husband about, I actually can't even use my office to meet with people (laughs) because of all the mail that gets dumped in there, right? Right. It's junk mail and journals. (laughs) And he was like, oh, I think you can just call up the facilities people and they'll come by with like this big dumpster <laughs> like a bin yeah right <laughs> you just push it all in there but <laughs> yeah yeah all right well i'm, I'm glad we had this conversation about off prints oh good i'm brought glad. back some fond memories thank you yeah, yeah. Uh, you're welcome <laughs> all right what's your latest pet peeve so my latest pet peeve is poor org structure and i can't this, uh, this sounds like something i would come up with come on org structure it's ridiculous. And I'm embarrassed that like I even care about org structure. Now let's hear it. But I do. And it's so important. Uh, my pet peeve about this is when there's poor org structure, there's no accountability. And so you don't know who to go to to get anything done. Okay. And no one knows who to tell you to go to to get anything done. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> that is my pet peeve. So you you need a diagram with like circles and arrows and boxes, right? Like so and so reports to so and so. Yeah, I don't even need that truthfully, although we can maybe in a future episode like talk about how those org charts like the meaning behind them and um why they're important. If there's not an understanding of who's responsible for what, even without something like written down, then that's a problem. Okay. It doesn't necessarily have to be that someone whips out an org chart and says, oh, I understand how this works. They just need to know, oh, Roger's in charge of whatever, putting the budget together for the grant, or you need to go talk to him. And when I go talk to you, you're like, oh yeah, I'm in charge of that, (laughs) right? That's all I'm asking. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, because more commonly, it's like, oh, yeah, Roger's in charge of the grant. And then you come to me and I'm like, oh, that's not what I do. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All 
I think it's more like there's value in having made the org chart than in, than the actual chart itself. Ah. In some ways, it's like we've thought about the structure of the organization, mm -hmm. you know, and here's what it should be. Right. I also think you know, there's a you know there's a common also what's the word uh, cliche maybe in 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 business which is that like the product that you ship is your org chart. Um, it's because it reflects the priorities that you, you know, how you organize the organ, you know, the, the business or whatever, right? So, um, any if, if like if there's a problem with your product that you're shipping, you know, it's it can be traced back to the you know the nature of your org chart. The org chart. Well, also your budget reflects your like values, right? Too. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, maybe we'll do a deep dive on org charts in a future episode. <laughs> maybe maybe there's some like org chart methodology that we're not aware of that maybe. we could report on, like PERT. Yeah, that's a sign. Like younger me, this is another. Oh, we, we have two pieces of advice that I didn't believe were true when I was younger. If someone told me when I was younger that the org chart mattered, <laughs> yeah, I would have laughed. <laughs> yeah, and here we are. Did we ever talk about like the excited reactions that we got to like my discussion of PERT? We never talked about that, I don't think. Um, we have a listener who tweeted about how excited she was. Yeah, like that just made my day, is all I'm saying. <laughs> that I'm just I'm just felt I just glad that like that person felt seen. Yes. Well I think I think we did talk about it. I'm almost positive we talked about it. Okay. Well, She's, she's a it. listener, so maybe she'll, she'll listen to the episode and <laughs> clarify whether we actually did talk about it or not. All right, moving on. What's coming up is just purely gratuitous on my part. Okay, make it quick. Okay, <laughs> so this is a bit of a stretch. This is lessons from golf, and the lesson is every field sort of has its own language and culture and sort of toys or gadgets. Okay. And so you can kind of feel like an outsider, you know, when you're like, trying to talk to someone who's in another field. And really in the end, it's just about language and toys and gadgets. And so I wanted to highlight a ridiculous gadget in the golf world. And I mainly wanted to highlight it because I was interested in your reaction to this. Okay. So I included a link and I don't know whether you've looked at this link. I'm looking at it right now. I was out playing golf and our son joined us. And he whips out a Sharpie, black Sharpie, mm -hmm. and this weird thing that looked like um, this plastic hair clip from the 80s, but it it was it held the, the golf ball. Like it had a clip that opened up and then it went around the golf ball. And, and what it does, and then he would take the black Sharpie and then write on the golf ball using this, this device that held the golf ball. And it turns out it, it creates a stencil so that you can have a like perfectly straight line that you draw on your golf ball with a Sharpie. Right. It's like, it's got, yeah. So you can like draw this line on the ball. Right. Right. And you use that to line your golf ball up for your putts. Okay. I just think that that's preposterous. So you're, what you're saying is that this is a pretty niche piece of equipment. <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. In every okay. field, every field has its niche toys and gadgets and equipment. That's all I'm saying. And I, like I said, this is a stretch, but it's mainly because I about, I, I literally about fell down laughing when this, when this whole scene <laughs> took place. Well, maybe we can think, what is like the most niche tool that you can think of in your field? <laughs> oh, wow. I mean, I feel like for me, it would be, it, I mean, besides a computer, I don't really use any tools, right? So it's it's probably some like, piece of software or something like that, right? Which you, you can get as niche as possible as you, as you want. Right, right, right. Um, I can't think if there's like a physical tool that I use as like part of my job. Yeah. There are things in our field that are really pretty niche. Like we put drops of allergen extract on people's skin and then prick their skin to see if they're allergic to it, right? Like if, I mean, it seems normal to me, but like if you were outside the field, you'd be like, well, that seems wacky. But there's like a tool dedicated to that process? Yeah, there are like these special, I mean, you don't have to use the, the tool, but there are, there are like tools specifically that are, you know, built for, you know, skin testing and 
That doesn't sound as preposterous, though. That sounds like it might serve a useful purpose. <laughs> it does, well, it does. It's, you know, there's a reason for it. But did you know about this golf ball tool thing? No, no, I had no idea. Okay, good. You're not as floored about it as I am. Well, I, I just assume that golf in general is like absurd. So like, of course it has yeah. these. Yes, yes. It's super absurd. Yes. Should we do the Leadership Academy? Yep. I have a, I have a depressing one for you. Are you ready? Bring it. <laughs> well, I've been thinking about institutions. Oh, really? <laughs> and, and platforms. I think, who was the person who had the maxims again? I can't remember. Simone's. Simone's max. Yeah, maxims, right? And one of them was that the institution never, was it like never loves you back or something like that? Right? Yeah, right. Or will right. never love you back or something. Right. right. And I feel like, I think there's a wrinkle on this one that I think it would be worth talking about and, or at least being aware of in the future. I don't know to what extent it will affect academics, but it's happening elsewhere. So I thought it's worth discussing. So I don't know how how much you keep track of like news about Apple or anything like that. I you know that I'm like an Apple fan, right? The yes, company, yes. Right? And so one of the issues with them going in right now is that they're being sued like left and right for antitrust activity. Uh huh. And one of the one of like the numerous <laughs> you know litigations happening is over the App Store, right? So you know you get an iPhone if you want to install an app you have to get it from the app store. That's the only way you can get an app onto an iPhone, right? Right. And developers who develop these apps are like upset, right? Because the app store, first of all, they take a cut, they take 30% of any revenue and um, and they impose all these rules and restrictions and you know, it's like you have to, it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's a burden to have to, to comply with everything. And if you violate anything, you get kicked off the app store or whatever, right? So it's like not pleasant. And you don't really have a choice. Like, if you want to put an app on the app phone, you have to deal with it, right? And a lot of what it's interesting to see this play out because it's like a lot of what the developers are complaining about. Some of it is about money. Some of it is just about like control over what they're doing. But I think I feel like it's a big theme. Is like, you know, they would be happy if Apple just like showed that like they cared about the developers, right? <laughs> Uh-huh. It's, I'm serious. Like it's it's interesting to see this play out because I don't even think they realize like this is what's happening, right? Uh-huh. And like they totally expect this to be like this is like a reasonable demand, <laughs> right? And I think it's interesting to see because I think if they all these are all like independent people, like independent developers, right? Like they they, they don't work for Apple, you know. They're not like you know. And I think if they worked for like a company, I think it, their perspective might be different. You know, because like it's like, oh, the company is like, you know, uh, you know, not treating us well. Like, well, just like every other company, right? But because they're like an independent developer, so they work for themselves, right? And they're partnering with this platform. Th- it's almost like there's an expectation, well, that the platform would do the thing that's like, you know, that would be good for them. Uh huh. Uh huh. But I think in reality, and I think this is, and Apple's not the only example. Like, I think anytime you see like people who work on a platform, whether it's YouTube or Instagram or Facebook or, you know, all these platforms are really dominating, right? And if you want to do a certain thing, you have to go through them, right? If you want to be make videos, you've got to go through YouTube, right? Right. And every single one of them has, like, a group of people who are on there who, who like, just want the platform to, like, show them some love, you know? <laughs> and it's, like, I think it's, like, it's interesting to see because I think this is, like, the modern version of like the institution will never love you back. Uh, right? uh, but it's, it's uh. different because they don't work for the institution. Right, right, right. But the relationship has become the same, I think. And, and even though they're not like employees. And it's like because they're like, if you work at a company, you have no choice but to like work through the company, right? Like like you can't like go to some other company, you know, without quitting your job. You know, you know it's like you're, you're stuck at this company. So in that sense, like the company has a monopoly over your time, Right. And if you want to like make videos for the public, like you have to work with YouTube. Like that's just the the only choice at this point, right? And so, or what is what you're saying that if people are an employee of an organization or an institution, they may not be wild about the fact that they're the institution doesn't love them back, but they understand that it's just this translational relationship and. They got to deal with it. They don't really, there's no choice in the matter. I mean, they could leave and go to another institution, but it'd be the same thing. Whereas there's this sort of false impression that you might have more power if you were an app developer 
using, you know, working through this platform because the employee employer relationship is not this sort of explicit one in that way, but functionally it, it, it does work that way. Well, at least in this respect. And I think and it, there is like a larger issue of like how, you know, whether the, these kinds of companies should have that much power. Right. Um, and, you know, I think that's a, that's lurking in the background, obviously, but I think nevertheless, I think it's interesting to see this evolve in, the, in almost the exact same way. I, it's just, I don't know. I, 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 and I think it'll be at some point, I don't think like there's been a collective realization <laughs> yet of this phenomenon. And I feel like it's coming. But because all these platforms are so relatively new, you know, you know it hasn't happened yet, I think. And so what is the leadership lesson in this? <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. <laughs> that's like, at least like, at least I was completely transparent and upfront about the fact that I just wanted to tell you about this stupid, crazy golf gadget. <laughs> well, I think if, well, okay, there's two perspectives you can take. One is that if you run one of these, if you're the leader of one of these organizations. Of, an or, of, a, of a platform. Of a platform, which is effectively serving as an institution, right? Uh-huh. Like, what are your priorities, right? Who do you serve? And And I think if you, it's like, at the end of the day, the institution comes first, is, is, is always the case, right? It doesn't matter if it's Johns Hopkins or if it's Google or YouTube, right? I think if I were to generalize, like the institution's customers come second, <laughs> right? And then in, the, in this case, like the app developers or whatever come third. Right. And I think that's kind of roughly speaking how it works at a, at a university too. And I, I think, I still think that like, People who work at universities are often surprised by that. But I think it's true if you work at a company, it's true everywhere. Right. And underpinning all of this is the way that the financial systems are set up, right? I mean, ultimately, the institution has to care about whether it's financially sustainable. Right. right? And so that drives the pecking order of who has the priority. Right, I mean, the institution has to has to um, survive, ma- ensure its ensure its survival. Exactly, right. Right, right. I I feel like this one was a was a darker one <laughs> 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 because it's not like I think that's good, but I do think that's what is. I, I think it's a, I, well, maybe I'm always like tend to be on the dark side. I think it's incredibly helpful to understand this, right? Because it empowers you in any position, whether you're in a leadership position or not, to navigate your career path. You understand that you're not expecting the institution to say, oh, look, Elizabeth, she's doing such great work. We're just going to shovel some money her way. Like, <laughs> Well, with, the, with one exception. Right. Which is that if it serves the institution to do so. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But if you understand that and you understand that you can go about and do your work and do impactful work and be very happy and find that rewarding and have it not necessarily be aligned with what the institution is going to fork out resources to do. But then that means you need to figure out how to, you know, ensure your own viability within the sort of context of the institution. And, and that, Um, Someone else said something to me just the other day about how you you can't take any of it personally, right? You get yourself in sort of, you can get yourself in upset and in trouble or whatever if you take these sorts of institutional decisions personally, right? Right. You decide what's important. You figure out a way to make it happen. And if there's a better context or institution for you to do that in, sure, go for it. But um you know, the base agreement between you and the institution is kind of usually set in pretty stark terms, right? Like we're hiring you because we're enthusiastic about the research you do. We think it's going to add value to our portfolio of faculty. And we need, we also need people, extra people to see patients with, you know, X or Y types of health conditions and you're expected to bring in X amount of your support. And that's it. It's cut and dry. You right. go do that. Um, and 
certainly you should at least expect what's promised to you know to you in that agreement but you shouldn't ever bank on getting anything more out of that agreement yeah and i think maybe this is just a roundabout way of me kind of saying that like i think when you go into a leadership position of really any kind by definition a leadership position is like representative of some institution right right um whether it's a department a division you know whatever um, and then, and so then it's kind of your, it, it becomes your job to consider the institution's needs, right? Um, and, and that's where the, I think ultimately the conflict comes in. Right. And there are other ways, which maybe we can talk about in another episode, um, how these conflicts play out between what you think is best for an individual, a research program, even potentially like your own personal views about a particular issue and what's best for the institution or the part of the institution you're leading um, come in conflict a lot, I, I find. Yeah. Look at that. We, re- we rescued it. It, yeah. did beca- it became a legit Rogers Leadership Academy topic. <laughs> yes. On the dark side, perhaps. On the dark side. But we're going to come to the light side now. Speaking of leadership. Yes. We're going to talk about the chair. Yes. So uh, last time we said we would talk about it, and this time we are. So this t- this is the Netflix. I think last time I forgot to say that it was on Netflix, but I think maybe that's easily discovered. Um, so this is the Netflix series about a woman who becomes a Korean-American woman who becomes the chair of an English department at some kind of liberal artsy-seeming university in the Northeast because it's snowing <laughs> or Northern part of the country. <laughs> of course. Yes. Yes. There's six episodes uh, and it's, I, I would call it like a dramedy maybe. I think it's maybe just a comedy. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so I guess maybe since I, it was my idea, I will ask you if you have any just overall thoughts on the series. So we're going to talk about the whole series. On the whole. Yeah. So I really enjoyed it. But I enjoyed it for, I think, two related reasons. For its humanity, because, and related to that, it gives you perspective on the absurdities of academia. Yeah. And and the absurdities, you know, it certainly puts a spotlight on gender and diversity issues and all of that. And it, it does it through kind of a comedic lens, which is fantastic. But and that in itself was important, but that helped to sort of spotlight the absurdities. So I, I, I'll, I'll kind of pause there. But it, the humanity was sort of the messiness of like, it's very hard to like separate out people's personal lives from their, you know, professional lives. And I'm sure this is true in across multiple, like many industries, but, you know, in academia, it for some reason feels more that way than, or maybe that's just my perception. Um, And so the faculty all have messy lives and the chair has a messy life and she's dealing with all sorts of absurdities of being a chair. And it's doubly hard because of, you know, her gender and her um, ethnicity and, but at the end of the day, they're like every single one of them, I find to be like incredibly like empathetic and likable characters. I think my general reaction was similar to yours. I felt like I enjoyed it. I, I felt like it was not without its flaws. Um, but overall, I think I like the series. And I also I thought it did a good job of depicting just kind of like all the different directions that like a chair can get pulled into. And just kind of how they can just be put in just in these just impossible situations, essentially, um, and never really get anything quite right, <laughs> or seemingly never get anything quite right. Um, and I think that is hard to understand until you're put into that situation. I feel like they depicted it well. So that I like. I, I think the the idea of like a kind of an Asian American in academia, I think, spoke to me very closely. Mm-hmm. Um, and I enjoy. I really enjoyed all the scenes with like her dad and like the. And the Korean family and stuff like that. I, those were to me were really funny, <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> and, um, and and I guess to be relatable, um, right? 
And maybe you can tell there's two, but I just, just personally. But I think, and um, I also I thought that the, you know, I think they really had to thread a needle. And just because you thread the needle doesn't mean that it's gr- that it's like it's good. Because like they had to make kind of academia relatable to gen- to like the general public. Um, and they had to also create like a human drama, so there had to be some sort of like human kind of conflict, right? And then, uh, and they had to make it funny too, on <laughs> top of all that, right? So I, I thought they did a pretty good job of that, but I, that 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 they could just end up being that like everyone's a little bit unhappy, you know? Um, <laughs> right, right. Because like you know, I've read some of the reviews, and everyone kind of had their opinion about it. I was like looking, tr- I was trying to find a review of like someone who is like an actual academic, <laughs> but there aren't that many like TV and movie writers who are like <laughs> academics, right? Right, right. So I don't, I couldn't find like a review of the show. Like I was looking at like trying to find some blogs or something like that. So if someone see, has one out there, I'd like to see it. Cause I, I feel like the TV and media writers were like, had a very different perspective, I think on the show. And, and I didn't read those reviews. What did they say? Oh, you know, they're mostly complaining. Well, one, so one issue, which I kind of have, is that there was so much time spent on the subplot of, like, the, of, what's his name, Bill. Um, uh-huh. Right, who right. Had the Nazi salute and the, and all, and, like. His, his wife had died. And, yeah. Right, right. And, and, they're like, and like, it was kind of, like, her job to, like, take care or to fix that situation for him. But they were, they were entangled in other ways. Yeah. And I feel like, to me, that was, like, I mean, I, maybe the writers kind of felt like they had to be a, an element of drama along those lines. Um, but I actually liked all the different characters. Um, like the, in particular, like the, um, what was the woman's name? Uh, oh, she was, she, she was relegated to the basement office. To the gym, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Not the basement office, it was like in the gym. It was the gym, right, right. And she'd look out and it was all these undergrads, like, you know, lifting weights. And it was like the free weight section of the gym. Right. That was, and, that, that was perfect. You know, and she was like a, I don't know if she was a Chaucer scholar, but it was something like that. Like she was this scholar of this part of like English literature that, for people who were, wouldn't be English professors would be sort of, you know, eye rolling for many people too, right? Like she had just like, like it wasn't like modern American literature or something like that, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I also, I mean, I think one of the other comment, I, general comment would say is that I feel like when you do like the first season of a show like this, uh, you, you can't like go off in every direction, right? Like you have to kind of develop the main character and and kind of that's it, really. Right. <laughs> and right. like maybe if there's a second season, you know, there's more room to kind of like address other issues. Um, but I feel like they had to focus on a few things, and and so other things kind of maybe were sacrificed. But um, other like academic issues were maybe sacrificed. But um, when I saw well, that scene, you know, where she gets like t- you know, put in the gym office, it reminded me. <laughs> so I had a conversation with someone here who was uh, in the faculty in the medical school. And uh, I remember we were like in the coffee shop or something like that. And, um, and she was moving to a new building in the medical school. And uh, I don't want to say what building because <laughs> I, like, I, there's like people who work there. I don't want them to feel bad. Uh, but I'll tell you which, you'll know what building I'm talking about. I'll text it to you. <laughs> okay. You'll know where this is going. Okay, you're texting it to me now yes. while we're recording. Oh, look, I got it. Oh, yes. And and she was saying that, like, oh, you know, I'm being moved to the, the medical school, you know, the faculty nursing home for the medical school. <laughs> yes. And I That's mean, a bad building. It's not a great building, yeah. And, um, and, and she was, you know, in pretty good spirits about it, actually. But um, it, it does happen, right? And I, I don't know to what extent. You know, I think well, you and I are at a slight disadvantage because, like, we don't work on a, like a stereotypical arts and science campus, right? Um, but but that stuff happens here too. So yeah, the other part that um, I thought they did a really nice job of like capturing the main character. She's always feeling like she's not doing a good job at work and she's not doing a good job as a mother. Yeah, and so she has this amazing daughter who. I love the daughter, Juju. Yeah. And Juju was like adopted. And I think it is like uh, Latina in her heritage, but yet like her mom is Korean and there's like this cultural tension between them. And the mom is always like 
can't go to some function or be there for the daughter and feeling bad about it and then having to turn around, you know, and spend her time at some like stuffy male dominated, you know, um, you know, social gathering or something to decide who's going to be the Stephen J. Smith, you know, lecturer of the academic year or something. And, um, and so I appreciate that. It reminded me of one time when my kids were like, they were young enough where maybe if you told them they needed to be quiet for, you know, 45 minutes or an hour, they would, but it was far from guaranteed. Um, and there was like some snow day or something. And so I was home and I had to be on this conference call. And I remember it was not a good parenting moment, yelling at them and saying, I'm the only woman and the only one with like kids this age on this call. So I'm shutting the door and you cannot come in here unless someone is like on fire (laughs) because these people do not understand these interruptions. You know, this is before now, I think people understand that more, but so it just sort of reminded me of a, a little bit about those days of trying to navigate the whole piece of kind of being a being a being a parent and being a mother specifically. And she has an even bigger task because she's like a single parent and her kids always causing trouble with the babysitters. Right. And... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought one scene that kind of uh, to me was a good uh, representation of kind of like how like she can't win is like I think it was in the last episode where uh that that junior faculty Yaz is like saying that she you know she has an offer from Yale or whatever it was I think it was yeah and and basically saying like it's like you know that she has that like that um GU and hasn't done enough basically right Um, right and here she is like doing her very hardest trying her hardest right 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 and it's like the faculty member that she probably values the most and represents the future of the department on top of everything. Right. Yeah. That she's kind of thought about the most. Right. Right. um, So I think that's the, and they're like, they're both right, you know? (laughs) And I think that's the, you know, that's what it comes down to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I also thought that one thing that was, that caught my eye was there was that one scene, it was a little unusual, but there was one scene with that kind of that older guy who is played by Bob Balvan, but I can't remember his name in the, uh, show now um who was supposed to be like co-teaching the that course with yaz oh yes yeah the, I, I can't remember his name in the show now but his there's one scene with him and his wife at home and it's the only scene where we see his wife and uh and most of the, i saw there a lot of reviews kind of focused on the fact that, it, that you know they that like she asked him to like wear these like diapers in bed oh yes <laughs> um but but i was i was kind of curious because i thought that scene was interesting because like i thought part of me thought well maybe she appeared in like other episodes and maybe got cut out or something like that. Um, because I felt like she seemed like the, like the, the, she was there to kind of depict a little bit of like what could have happened to, to ji if like an alternate path had been taken. Right. Right. Um, right. Cause she makes this comment about, like, yeah, you know, if someone had to raise the kids and uh, you know, and, um, and she never published that book or whatever. And I thought that was kind of just like an interesting moment. So when's the next season coming? I would, I, I don't, I don't know. They haven't announced anything. I I would be surprised if there is a second season. I don't. I mean, uh-huh. oh, oh, you think you're you think it's done? Well, I don't think it quite had the like, uh, what's I the like kind of media reaction that would justify a second season. I don't know. I mean, I feel like they set some things up for a possible second season, but um, I don't know if it was like had enough. Yeah, I think it probably doesn't have enough broad appeal. Yeah. 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 Well, I'll, let me ask you this: How, What was your reaction to like the the sets, like so, like the offices and all that kind of stuff? Did it feel realistic to you? Mm, it felt stereotypical. I mean, not in a bad way, right? I mean, they were trying to be stereotypical. But like, because I noticed there were a lot of com- comments on Twitter, in particular, that were like like offices don't look like this, right? I was gonna say. I mean, I think they don't in many buildings but in some buildings in some colleges in some circumstances they do right the musty old wood paneling and books lying around and i mean it's not meant to be realistic right it's meant to be like a well it may not be representative but i do think it's realistic okay yeah that's yes yeah because i do, there are there are 
for sure <laughs> colleges and universities would have offices that look exactly like that. Right, right. Yeah, because um, I've been there. <laughs> <laughs> they tend to be like, you know, private schools in the Northeast. But um, even still, though, it is a, so it's not too, super, I think for the most part, it's not realistic. But Yeah. Any other thoughts? I don't think so. I mean, you know, I I watch things to be entertained, so I may be less critical than, and I was I was entertained, and I, I I'd welcome a second season. I guess if you would you recommend it to another academic? Yeah, if you're looking for something to sort of binge and be that's entertaining for sure. Yeah. Okay. I kind of, I also like um, is it uh. Who's the actor that played Bill? Oh, Jay uh, Duplass. Yeah, Jay Duplass. That's right. I was going to call him Joe. I'm like a big fan. I'm a big fan of his. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I don't know why. Like he's just sort of this endearing kind of. Maybe it's the characters he plays too. Endearing, sort of, kind of scruffy, charming person. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> he's yeah. I thought all the actors they got a great cast. I thought for they the, do. Yeah. And uh, oh, we have to talk, we we have to talk about the Dean character. Oh yes. Like what did you did that did that I'm curious to think how you how realistic you felt that kind of depiction was. Um well I think just like you like you picked out the theme of like she can never win. There's sort of her he's representative, I thought of like she had aspirations for the department. And to go back to this idea about, you know, the institution has its own set of incentives you know, that, um, are strong and determine its priorities. He exemplified that. And they, in the end, even if he desired when she was hired for her to sort of achieve her vision, there's all this baggage that prevents that from happening. And the baggage includes like his own obligations. Right. Right. I don't know. That was that was my sense. What about you? Yeah, no. I mean, I I think it was. Um, I think it was a uh, reasonably I think, characterized in the in the show. Um, That's not to say I hate all deans. If there are any deans listening, <laughs> please do not be offended. <laughs> yeah, I just think it's clear that you know they're they're looking out for a different set of interests. Is what it comes down to, right? And I think it's just hard to feel. It's hard to know that until you see it. I think. Right. Yeah. Okay. Should we save our next topic for the next episode? Yes, we, we, we've now pushed it for two episodes. So we'll definitely we're going to talk about in the in a future episode, sort of the one page introduction when you revise and resubmit an NIH grant, right? Yes. Okay. So we're going to go on to weekly grind. I'll go first, and I'm I'm mainly mentioning this for you know the human humanity part of things, which is that my weekly grind was that. I had a migraine yesterday and had to clear off my whole calendar. And it was like the second, I think I had, last time I had to do that was like five years ago. And it was a bummer. Like I felt like it was a bummer, not just because I had the migraine. I just hated the fact that like everything had to be canceled. Yeah. But I'm all, I'm all recovered after lots of ibuprofen and sleep. Uh, that's good news. It is good news. Yes, you migraines do get better. I was one of those people who missed you yesterday. So well, th- thank you. <laughs> yes, I canceled on you, and I needed feedback on that Ames page too. Oh, that I had to cancel that, but we rescheduled, so it's all good. I, uh, you know, what season it is? It's promotion letter season. Oh yeah, <laughs> I wrote one of those too. I, you know, I have to say, there's something about promotion letters that that's a little bit just kind of I don't know, I don't know. Maybe the, maybe you get different kinds, but it's like I feel like it's like waiting at the finish line of a marathon, and then like seeing the the winner like come over the finish line, and then someone comes to you and says like, "Does this person look like a winner to you?" You know, <laughs> it's like. <laughs> I don't know. It's like, yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. I mean, so sometimes I kind of feel a little bit stupid just writing these things, but maybe I only get the good cases. No, I feel stupid kind of writing them too. And maybe we could talk about them more in another thing, but I will often like, because I'll often send the criteria they have for that rank or that track. Yeah. 
And I will literally structure my letter around those criteria <laughs> and each paragraph lists the evidence for what they mean that. And it feels like, like you want to do it. You're excited. The person deserves to be promoted, but it feels like a bit of a bureaucratic exercise. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's all there and their CV and, you know. No, I kind of do the same thing too. I mean, it's a little bit like an NIH grant. It's like if they want to know what your innovation and, you know, significance is, then you like talk about your innovation, and your significance. Right. And so like if they have these like three criteria that they want, you just like, boom, you hit them. Right. <laughs> like there's no sense of being around the bush. Right. Right. Um, so, but anyway, it's just a, but that's all. <laughs> Nothing specific. That's all. Yeah. So um, I think that's a wrap. You can find us on Twitter. Our Twitter handle is at the effort report, or you can email us or email address is the effort report at gmail.com. Thanks everybody for listening.